Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. In the name of the one holy and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. This is a curious gospel. It seems like this passage is full of non sequiturs, a lot of things that don't quite make sense. It doesn't really follow a, a progression of order. It, it, it sort of, there are all these surprises that happen. What does falling into the ground like a seed and dying have to do with the Greeks who are coming um, to want to see Jesus? Why is it that Jesus, when he hears that these outsiders are coming, these unnamed Greeks, we're not even sure that they're Jews, um, who are coming to worship at the festival in Jerusalem, why is it that their presence, um, Andrew and Philip um, coming to them, coming to bring them to Jesus, why does that spark Jesus, lead Jesus to say, now, now is my moment, now is the moment of glorification, and unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it won't bear any fruit. What, what does that, how does that make sense? How does the introduction of strangers um, have to do with the, the rising up of Jesus and his crucifixion? It's a, it's a curious gospel passage. Um, and I think, I think it has to do, as I've been praying about it over the week and, and wondering, sometimes I look at the well, most of the times, I look at the gospel passage that, we're, that I'm supposed to preach on the following week um, on Monday, and I read it, and I, I keep a little passage of it, and I put it in my pocket. And, and I sometimes sort of look at all of the conversations that I have during the, during the course of the week and, and what I see when I read in the paper or hear in the radio. I sometimes see it through the lens. I try to see it through the lens of this, the gospel. Have you ever tried that? You ever look at the coming week's gospel? No, probably not. <laughs> you can do that. You know, we have, you know, we have the technology. You could do this. You could do it really easily. You just have to go on the web or you can go in the back of the prayer book and decode those long tables back there. Um, sometimes I do that. It helps me sort of get grounded in, in God's word for the coming week. Um, I'm so interested why, why is it that the arrival of the Greeks um, lead Jesus to say, okay, now's the time? Remember earlier in the gospel when Jesus um, is at the wedding in Cana and they run out of wine and Jesus, Jesus uh, Mary, his mother, sort of mentioned this to Jesus. Do you remember what he says? He's kind of surly. He's a little bit like my teenage son. He says, you know, what has that got to do with me, mom? I mean, it's, you know, that's their problem. It's not my problem. Um, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come, Jesus says. But now, now it comes. And as we're approaching the great Paschal feast, we're approaching Holy Week. Next week it begins. Um, next week is Palm Sunday. Um, we're really moving right up to the events that lead to the, to the cross. I have a feeling that um, Episcopalians who've always, and this is, you know, this is why we, we, we bring in the Lutherans uh, to help <laughs> us with this. But Episcopalians, um, you know, there's the E word. You know what the E word is? It's not Episcopal. It's evangelism. You know, that's the word that we don't want to talk about. The, the sort of how do we bring, how do we get these Greeks how do we get these strangers, those who aren't in these pews, how do we get them to come into this, this fellowship of hope and life and love? How do we do that? Um, we struggle with this a lot. We, we went through this whole process of, of um, programs called Come and See, do you remember? Um, where we would invite people to just come and see. Come, come and see what's going on in here. And sometimes that worked. You know, people would come for a week or two, and then maybe not after that so much. Um, what it did was make us wonder, well, what, what exactly are we 
asking them to come and see. <laughs> do we really want them to see what's going on in here? Or do we want to see you know, the various internal politics that churches always have? Do we really want to see the, the you know, invite them to come to the, the tuna wiggle at coffee hour? Will that really do it? That'll be, that'll be our evangelistic tool. Um, but Jesus does something else. It's not come and see so much, but go and listen. Go and listen. It could be that where I've seen in the wider church and here in New Hampshire, that the places where people are interested and seem to have uh, developing a relationship with God is when we, we disciples, go and show some curiosity about what's going on in their lives. We actually ask questions like, how are you doing? Um, what, what, what are you struggling with? Um, is there anything that I can do to be present when you're your spouse is going through a, a, a disease or a, some hardship. Can I just show up? Um, curiosity. Curiosity. We just came from um, a meeting of uh, Robert um, Putnam. Has anyone heard of Robert Putnam? He's a, a Harvard sociologist. And years ago, he wrote a book called, wrote a book called Bowling Alone. Um, Bowling Alone was a, it was a bestseller, and it really talked about how America's, America's become much more stratified, and we've become much more uh, a country of individualists. We were always individualists, but, but the sense of those things that knit us together, that bound us together, like bowling leagues, or the Knights of Columbus, or men's groups, or you know, different, different activities that would bring people together of different classes, sometimes different races, and they would actually share news about each other's life. Um, those things have been kind of breaking apart. And we find ourselves living, again, in, in sort of silos, living apart. And we feel kind of protected one from another you know, the rise of the gated, the gated communities, right? Um, this is a reflection of sort of something about the culture not being curious about the other. And what now, Robert Putnam, his new book, it just has come out, called Our Kids, is really, he says, he describes something, um, he, des he describes them in sort of scissor graphs, what he calls are scissor graphs. And I think what they describe is what we all know anecdotally by stories. That my kids, and probably the children that you know, um, go to after school programs, they play sports, they have piano lessons, they are in French club or debating societies or something like that. And they, they're learning some so, sort of social capital. They're learning how to relate to one another, how to be curious about the world. And they have, they go to, they, there's, there's, there's dinner. You have, you have family dinner. Most of you, have you, does anyone know what family dinner is? Do you remember, remember that? <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's a, there's a growing um, segment of our population where homes are broken, um, that they don't have, where, where uh, they've really taken it on the chin economically. And so under that stress, and often um, their they're, they're parents are absent, they're not, they're not learning those social skills. And so there's a, wide, there's a widening, like a scissor, there's a widening disparity between those who have that, those kind of soft social skills that Episcopalians are kind of known for having, um, and those who don't. My, my wife, Polly, has been active in something called, in the Lakes region here, called the Circle Program. Have you heard of the Circle Program? It's, a, it's an amazing um, organization that, that invites young girls, young women, who, um, who are at risk. Their, their homes are under tremendous stress. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're perhaps on the free or reduced lunch programs. They're not particularly... Uh, 
uh, participating in any of the after school programs that, that are um, available for kids of, of greater needs. And they, there's a summer camp on, um, I think, Newfound Lake. And, but the, but the, the hallmark of it is that they're placed with mentors um, through the year who interact with them, who are, take an active interest in how they're doing in school. And Chantelle is my, my wife's um, charge. She's about 13 years old, um, has never gone skiing, never gone skating, um, it only goes swimming if Polly brings her to the local Y in Concord. And yesterday, she met some neighbors, and, and she kind of shirked away. She said, you know, Polly said, Chantel, I'd really like you to meet Joan. And Chantel was like, I don't, you know, I don't really like to meet people. And there's this kind of, um, there's this kind of social break, a chasm. And it's really rending the fabric of our society, isn't it? Um, and you, and they're leading into a, a life of despair, of anger. Um, the interaction that they're getting is probably on computer games, which can be rather violent. And this is how they're learning how to be citizens. Um, our church has tremendous resources to be mentors and to actually show some curiosity about those who don't have all the blessings of the life that we've been so enriched by. And we can find ways to do this. We can find ways to do this as a, as a church. I think, you know, our own curiosity is, I think, the way to bridge these gaps. It's, it's a way of being, of practicing true religion, true religion. I think I've heard Bill say this before, maybe at the institution. You know the word religion um, is, comes from the same word from which we get ligament or ligature. It's the things that connect, are binding together. We exercise, we practice religion here because we seek to be connected, reconnected with God which we have at this font, we become one with Christ. We are dead and raised with Christ by virtue of our baptism. And that connection, that bond is renewed and recharged because we forget, we're, we're generally forgetful people. Um, we forget that identity and so we we recharge it, we renew it, we re remember ourselves, we reconnect every time we take this sacrament. And we become what we eat. We become what we receive in the sacrament of new life. So how, how do you, in the, in the next few days, where's your curiosity? Are you a curious person? Do you have any interest in who your neighbor is? Do you wonder what's going on behind their doors? Do they, do they care and wonder about what's going on in your life? Are there moments, are there places of contact where you actually find out what they're doing? How do they make a living? And more than that, what are they struggling with? What are they struggling with? Have you ever asked, is there anything that I could pray for? Is there something that I could pray for? Or, or the question, what do you think God is up to in this situation? I think Jesus connects that with the dying of a grain. Because if you're like me, I'm an introvert. Asking a stranger anything about their life is like death, <laughs> is like what? You want me to go and sort of begin a conversation with somebody? Well, yeah, that's what it means to be a human being. There are places in the church where this is happening in spades, in the Episcopal church, and I see that this is where our renewal is taking place. If, has anyone heard, if, have you heard anybody talk about something called laundry love? 
Have you heard about this? The Diocese of Los Angeles. I'm a bishop, so I get to tell you about what's going on outside New Hampshire. I also get to tell you, part of my job is to tell you what other people in the diocese are saying behind your back. <laughs> and I can say it's all good things. It's all good things. But let me tell you about this thing called laundry love. Some people just showed up at a coin-operated laundromat and just sort of went there, read the paper, and, and they noticed that there are some people there regularly, and, and they just began to strike up a conversation with those who are outside their usual circle of influence or, or knowledge, like the Greeks, those who are outside, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, the non-Episcopalian, the non-privileged. And they just started over time, it took some time, sharing something, learning about their life. They actually brought some, you know, rolls of coins to help with the laundry, those who needed it. And they, at some point, they asked, well, is there, could, could we do a little Bible study here in the laundromat? Or would you be interested in me praying for your child who I see here is, is not in school? And the grain of wheat began to sprout in this place in Los Angeles. And a community started to form right there in the laundromat. And before you know it, you've got church. You've got people being real and genuine with each other, being human beings with each other. It grew so much that there began to be a service on a Saturday evening with the laundromat going, with the washing machines going and the dryers, you know, moaning. And it's, so it's nice and warm. Um, and the Bishop of Los Angeles, John Bruno, actually ordained a deacon in the laundromat in the laundromat with hymns and everything else. And that person's about to become priesthood. There are baptisms among the, the water in the sinks. Um, that's the kind of thing that Jesus is doing. This kind of go and listen. Not so much come and see, but go and listen. Where are we being asked to go out beyond those who look and talk and dress like we do? among the Greeks, the Gentiles, those who are outside of us. It will feel like a kind of death, right? It's not how we normally do things. It will feel uncomfortable. But maybe this is exactly where God is asking us to experience both crucifixion and resurrection. Something in us is dying. And that's a beautiful thing, Jesus says. That is a beautiful, life-giving thing because we find ourselves connected with all those people. The whole, the whole catastrophe of humanity is being raised up in Christ. So let's be curious. Let's ask some questions. Let's get to know each other and get to know folks who are beyond our, our numbers. And then Jesus will say, he will draw all people to himself and raise them to new life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.